Uh, welcome everyone to the first of our two part uh, soil webinar series. We have been working on this project all summer, so I'm really happy that today is finally here. Um, we have um, yeah, been working with NOFA Mass to learn uh, some carbon proxy protocols um, that come, uh, you know, that have come from other places as well. And um, we'll go over all of that. Um, but just to get started, uh, today we're focusing on dairy, livestock, and field crops, um, assessments that we've performed at those farms. Um, please remain muted during the videos and presentations. Um, oh, we forgot to change that because we do not have videos for you tonight. <laughs> Um, chat questions uh, or ask them yourselves during the discussion period at the end. Um, we decided not to have um, Q&A in between these sessions, the little presentations, um, just for the sake of, of getting through the presentation. So uh, either hold your questions or feel free to pop them into the chat and we will keep track of them and hold them until the discussion period. Um, we do welcome your feedback. We will be providing a link for an evaluation. Um, and we will also provide you with a follow-up email tomorrow with links to any resources we've discussed. Um, a lot of them will be shared this evening, but we will share them again in an email tomorrow in case you miss anything. Um, our field days um, webinars are free for everyone. We do um, limit access to the recordings for NOFA New York members. So that is a benefit of membership. If you are not currently a member, um, consider joining. And um, before we get started or, or at any point, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, so, Tonight, this is a look at uh, how things will, you know, at least how we planned it out. You never know how it's going to go, but um, we will kind of go over a little bit of um, what the background information um, as far as the carbon proxy protocols. We'll do introductions um, and then we'll present some of the um, assessments that we've been doing this summer and some of the results that we. Um, have seen on farms across the state. Um, and then uh, we will have a little presentation um, from Joseph Amsali at uh, Cornell, who will discuss a little bit about a report that he's worked on. And then the rest of the time will be open for a Q&A discussion. So that is how we will proceed. All right, so I will begin just by um, doing some in introductions. Uh, Carol, uh, Carol Razel is from NOFA Mass, and she has been training us on these protocols um, and sort of uh, advising us on our programming moving forward, um, incorporating these protocols into our soil health programming. Uh, Joseph Amsali, I mentioned before, is with uh, Cornell and has also been helping us out with this project this summer. Um, and then um, I think right now I'm actually going to let our farmer participants introduce themselves before we uh, move forward into the carbon proxy protocols. So um, Adrian, would you like to go first? Sure, thanks. So my name is Adrian Traub. I farm at Hedgerow Hill Farm and also with Main Street Farms. And I've been farming for nine seasons now. Um, I started off with vegetables and right now I'm doing blueberries and um, I just raised lamb. Um, so learning a lot more about pasture management um, for my soils, um, which has been a great experience. Um, I have a background in food systems and I also I uh, work full time for a small nonprofit in Portland that works on um, increasing food access for low income folks. Awesome. Um, Lucas Ashman, will you give us a little introduction? Sure. Yeah, I'm, uh, my name again is Luke Ashleman. Uh, I'm a part of the Ashleman Farm LLC with a, a partnership with my father. Uh, I've been full time on our dairy for 10 years now. I started in 2010. Uh, in 2009, I did a little 
stint back in my parents' home country in Switzerland, trying to learn how to make cheese and, and work in the alpine industry on the agricultural side. Uh, and I found myself back at home uh, joining the farm right, right about when we transitioned from conventional to organic in 2009, 2010. Uh, we've been grass-fed, 100% grass-fed since 2015, and we've been shipping milk and selling to uh, Maple Hill since then. Uh, my father's got uh, 40, well, probably 50 years plus experience, so he, him and I are, are uh, pretty much a two-man team at the moment, and we're uh, learning things every day, and, and we manage our, our pastures every year a little bit differently, but we kind of manage it for the most part, try to try to just keep everything in, in a, a routine. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about that further as well. Awesome, thank you. And Luke Gianforte, will you please introduce yourself? My name's Luke Gianforte uh, with Gianforte Farm here in Casnovia, New York. Uh, we farm about 800 acres of row crops and small grains, all certified organic. Uh, we've been organic since the late 90s. Um, try to do try to do as much as we can for soil health with cover crops and um, different rotations and everything. Um, so that's about it. Awesome. And um, I realized I was trying to go without my notes and I missed a few things. I will just again remind everyone, if you um, are not speaking, just uh, keep yourself on mute. Uh, there will be opportunities to ask questions um, during the discussion period and feel free to put them in the, in the chat and we will ask them during the discussion period. Um, one other thing I forgot uh, very importantly to uh, Thank our sponsors, uh, Maple Hill Organic, uh, New York FarmNet, Upstate Niagara Cooperative, and New York State Energy Research and Development, ICERTA, have all sponsored our, our field days this season. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Caro, who will share, uh, give some more background information about the carbon proxy uh, testing and some of the work she's doing at NOFAMAS. All right, thanks so much, Brianna. I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my screen here. Let's see. All right. Can you see it? Can you all see my slides? Hmm. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. I'm getting an error message just saying that I'm not allowed to share my slides, but it looks like I can ignore that. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, so as Rihanna said, I'm Kara Roselle. I work with uh, NOFA Mass. I'm the education director and I run our um, soil technical assistance program. Um, I do uh, soil health advising with farmers um, and I've been had the great uh, um, good uh, good luck to be able to work with NOFA New York this season on um, training some of the um, team in soil health assessment the way that we've been doing it at NOFA Mass. Um, so I just want to say a little bit about, you know, what that soil health assessment uh, program is, a little bit about the background. Um, we call them the NOFA carbon pro proxy tests, but it's essentially field soil health assessment. Um, and, you know, the purpose of them uh, has to do with evaluating the soil for the physical characteristics of the soil that can indicate the soil's uh, level of health, right? Because soil life, soil health, soil biodiversity, soil carbon, all of these things are interrelated in the soil and they can be seen as proxies for each other, which is why we call them the, the soil carbon proxy tests. Um, and since soil organic carbon is hard to directly measure without expensive verification methods, we wanted to develop a toolkit for growers in our network to be able to do some sort of uh, basic field assessment that they themselves can uh, conduct on their own or with a technical consultant from, from NOFA um, to be able to sort of skip the step of needing to send something into, into a lab and also to be able to take a more holistic view um, of their soil. Um, the, the 
assessments that we do can help to identify constraints to, as well as opportunities for um, soil carbon storage um, and therefore healthier um, agroecosystems. Um, and the, the NOFA technicians involved in the program um, have a detailed version of the protocols that they do. Um, I'm just gonna drop something in the chat real quick here. Um, actually, so I don't have access to the, ch uh, the chat when I'm screen sharing, Brianna, can you drop that um, link that I shared at the beginning with you? Thanks. Sure, the folder with all the resources? Yeah, exactly. I just realized I wouldn't be able to uh, do that while I'm, um, while I am uh, sharing my screen. So uh, Brianna's gonna drop in the chat for you a folder of resources that contain both the technical protocols and also a grower version of the protocols. So NOFA technicians do a slightly more detailed version of the protocols, which you'll be able to see when you, when you look through those. Um, but most of the tests overlap between the technical protocols and the grower protocols. So many of the things that technicians will do if they come out to your farm to give you an evaluation, you can actually repeat those, those tests using the instructions that we provide. So the goal is to sort of make it easier for farmers to uh, conduct some of the same evaluations that we're doing as technicians. Um, a little bit of background about the test. So uh, the NOFA carbon proxy tests were developed in 2016 by Jack Kittredge, who's um, the outgoing editor of The Natural Farmer um, and who was our NOFA mass policy director for many years. Um, and it really, it brings together different field protocols that have been developed by NRCS, um, Cornell, the Ohio State University, the Soil Carbon Coalition and Woods End Labs. Um, and so none of them are original to, to NOFA, it's just the combination and sort of the approach that we take to them. Um, and then the tests were revised um, in the win this past winter um, by myself and one of our technicians at NOFA, Mass, um, to more directly harmonize with the NRCS field um, assessment protocols, um, which allows us to have more exchangeability uh, of data and collaboration with NRCS tools. Um, and of course, as I said, uh, many of our fellow SIFSA chapters are um, developing and training in these protocols themselves, and they're, the way that they use them will vary by state. So we've shared the folder. Um, just very briefly, you know, zooming out, the goal here is really to take, um, to sort of collapse to what are sometimes seen as binary approaches where a lab approach to looking at your soil is sort of seen as more scientific and objective and, um, you know, has a lot of certainty. Whereas farmer observations, some people view them as kind of more qualitative and subjective and um, holistic and um, experiential and what, the carbon proxy tests do is they really sort of collapse that distinction and help to provide some quantification around um, observations that farmers are making. It's, it's both experiential and it's something you can uh, record if you'd like to take down data yourself um, so that you can keep records of your soil. Um, it's self-determined and that the farmers can do many of the tests themselves. Um, and it's also holistic at the same time as being quantifiable. So that's kind of, kind of the goal here. Um, I'm not going to explain all the tests now because I know Brianna is going to go through and uh, give an explanation of them, but if you want to read, this is just a list of what tests we do. Um, they're described in details in, detail in the um, folder that Brianna shared with you, so feel free to, to go and dig into that as you, as you like and follow along with uh, the explanation that Brianna is going to give of some of the tests. Um, but I did just want to give a brief note that if you're going to be doing any of these tests on your own, on your own farm, what I really want to recommend is that there's two sort of broad ways to use them. One is comparative, uh, in which case you can look through tests, decide which ones you want to do on your own soil, and then compare a couple different fields or management practices on your own farm, such as a pasture versus an annual crop field, um, an area in cover crops versus an area in vegetables. Um, if you have a small garden on your farm and then you know a large um, field production space, you can compare those, things like that. Um, in that case, you would just sort of run the tests uh, on the same day, ideally, or the same week, um, to see sort of what's what's looking uh, the same and different between those fields. Um, but if you're going to do change over time and try to track track change over time, ideally, what you do is again select the tests you're interested in running. You don't need to run all of them. Um, choose a representative spot in the field that you're analyzing, and make a detailed map to that spot using a surveyor's tape and um, permanent landmark. So I like to measure from you know like a 
a gateway or a structure on the farm. Um, and then you can run those tests annually at the same time of year. It's important to do it at the same time of year because soil in, this, in the relatively the same spot because soil is variable uh, through time and also um, uh, by time of year and also in the field. So same spot and same time of year every year. You can do it more than once a year if you're really excited. Um, and just to briefly also say that some of the ways that we're starting to use this data now that we've been doing this for many years is um, starting to look at the ways that our field protocols map onto or are correlated with um, lab data. So we, we have done some projects where we've collected both lab tests and done the carbon proxy tests on um, a series of farms. And we are starting to see sort of how strong of an indicator um, different, um, different field methods that we use um, are of organic matter, for instance. And we also use them sometimes uh, within groups of farmers. So a group of farmers will get together and we'll run those tests for that farmer every year for a certain number of years defined by the grant. Um, and then we'll look at the indicators uh, by the farm management practices. And it can be used as a really effective peer-to-peer -peer benchmarking or peer-to-peer -peer learn learning tool within a group of farmers. So this is just an example of, um, you know, some data we looked at where we looked at infiltration rate with uh, different farms within our peer-to-peer -peer learning group um, by management practice. So that was kind of interesting. Um, and lastly, I just want to say um, in the folder that we dropped into the chat there, um, is the is a accessible growers manual version of the protocols with data sheets and it has um, a little bit of interpretation for each, each test just to give you a little bit of a guide if you want to kind of understand what you're seeing. Um, and I really encourage you just, you know, print it out, take it out to the field and play with it. Um, and if you have any questions or need any guidance, um, you can give your local NOFA chapter a call, um, Brianna, and I'm also happy to, uh, to help as well if you need any um, questions answered about that. So with that, I will uh, transition over to Brianna and she's going to go into depth on some of the protocols. Awesome, thank you. Um, I am noting that we're just a few minutes ahead of schedule. So if anyone does have a question right now that they wanna ask Caro, um, we do have a few minutes if you, um, if anyone would like to ask a question. All right, doesn't look like it. <laughs> um, okay. We will just move on then. <clears throat> Uh, so as Carol described, we, um, we have been working with NOFA Mass on training on these protocols. And um, so a lot of what I'm going to present is sort of in, in the year of our training. So I'm, I'm just sort of giving that a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, a lot of the times when we were doing these, um, especially with this year being such a drought year, uh, it was hard to really say that we had good conclusive data. Um, and certainly we were, it was, there was sort of a learning curve for us as far as um, figuring out choosing a site or like, um, which I think um, some of these things came up as we were at the farms and uh, we were able to work through them and, and learned a whole lot from it. But um, I'll, I'll discuss a lot of that as I proceed. All right, so just some other um, notes where, um, again, that a lot of these we were doing um, maybe not at an ideal time, but we kind of, our staff discussed that it, it was sort of interesting to be able to do some of these assessments um, in really dry conditions because it sort of gave you an understanding of, of how the soil behaves in a drought year or like, you know, how infiltration rates are affected when it's really dry. So um, whether or not we were doing at quote unquote the best time of year, I think we still had a lot of takeaways. Um, and, uh, but I think overall, I think Carol would agree with this, that in general, um, the recommendation is um, to conduct these in the spring or fall <clears throat> in general. But I think overall, um, this does give you sort of a framework to assess your soil on your own, either 
as a standalone assessment or in conjunction with soil lab testing. Um, and overall, it really just kind of gives you um, insight into some of the indicators of uh, healthy soil. So I'm gonna go farm by farm um, and I'll be uh, describing some of the protocols. Um, if you don't have um, the data sheets um, or, or don't care to look at them right now, the protocols, uh, we will be sending that out, out in a follow up email. All right, so I'm just going to skip this slide because I think Kara went over this just sort of like a, a brief list of what some of these tests are. I will be going um, through them throughout this presentation. So we are going to start with Gianforte Farm, which is one of the six farms we visited this summer. And um, Luke, if you would like to uh, discuss a little bit about your management practices and soil health goals, that would be great. Yeah, so uh, like I said in the introduction, we're uh, growing row crops and small grains. Um, the field that we did the, the test on this summer, um, had been in long-term hay until 2015. Um, we purchased it, been certified organic, um, and then it went into our rotation. We traditionally have done a three-year rotation of corn, soybeans, or dry beans, and then into a small grain um, with clover under it. We've been trying to stretch that rotation out the past few years um, and get some cover crops incorporated in some more places rather than just the red clover under small grains um, and like to go to kind of a more of a four or five year rotation. Um, so playing around with that, seeing how, how that works, what does work and what doesn't work. Um, so with, with being organic for 20 plus years now, um, with all the tillage that is involved, we're seeing that we're deciding that we need to try to find ways to get away from the tillage or let the ground rest for a longer period of time in between tillage events. So it's a constantly evolving process uh, and we are far from having it figured out yet. Thank you for sharing. So I'm first just going to talk briefly on the slake test. Um, so the slake test um, was based on work by NRCS and Washington State University. Um, and the purpose is to observe the maturity of aggregates and resistance of aggregates to erosion events and compare management practices on the land. So for this test at Gianforte Farm, um, we took two clods of soil. We took uh, one from the field where we were doing uh, our all of our assessments and then we took one from another site for comparison. We placed each clod into a wire mesh basket and submerged them both into water and then we watched to see which soils, um, which soil clods held together and which ones fell apart or um, you know sort of assessing the amount um, to which they held together um, and so you can uh, assess so, um, the soil with poor structure is the one that will begin to fall apart. So if they're staying together more then they have better soil structure. So um, a Gianforte farm, we took one clod from the assessment site and then um, the nearby field, if I recall correctly, um, had only been in production for a couple of years and then previously was woods and brush. Is that correct, Luke? Yeah, it was recently, recently cleared. Um, so it was as close to a, a native soil, I guess you would call it as, as you can get. So um, the, the left side um, you can see is from the testing site. And then the one, um, the clot on the right is from the adjacent field. Um, so we, our assessment, we um, 
observed and um, wrote down that we had 94, 95% of the clod that stayed intact on the field, on the assessment field, and then on the nearby field, um, 99%. So you can see that um, it wasn't too big of a difference, but the field um, that had experienced less tillage uh, had a little bit better structure to it. Uh, the next assessment uh, that we did there was um, part of the digging a hole assessment, which is actually a group of assessments. Um, and the one that I'm showcasing here is uh, looking at root behavior. So um, the digging, um, so for the digging a hole, you'll dig a hole that is one cubic foot and you reserve the soil uh, for other assessments um, in a container on a tarp. Um, as far as observing the roots, we take note of the depth of the deepest root, the depth at which the majority terminate, and how many of the roots are growing sideways or balled up. These root assessments help give us an understanding of how the roots are interacting with the soil and can indicate constraints such as compaction. So in this case, we concluded that the deepest root was um, you know, it went all the way to the bottom of the hole. So we indicated that, that was at least 12 inches. The majority of the roots terminated at five to six inches. And uh, we didn't know any uh, sideways or balled up roots. Right. And this photo here actually isn't from inside the hole, but I wanted to show it anyway, because we did find this in a different part of the assessment field and you can see the worm coming out of one of the holes and then you can see quite a few number of um, biopores which are created by the worms. Um, so that definitely indicates um, good healthy soil with all those biopores. And we will come back to that assessment a little bit later on, but I just wanted to draw attention to that photo. <clears throat> So the next one uh, that I'll highlight is infiltration. And uh, water infiltration, the water infiltration assessment, um, you look at how fast the water sinks, absorbs into your soil, and it's an indicator of biological, ac biological activity and healthy soil structure. We look at how long it takes an inch of water to absorb into the landscape and compacted soils, even when there's plants growing there, can uh, take longer while biologically active soil can be anywhere from a few minutes to a few seconds. So in this case, um, we had an infiltration time that was a little bit on the longer side for what we've seen this summer. Um, it was 90 minutes and 41 seconds. Um, due to time, we didn't conduct a second trial, but in this case, um, if we would have wanted to uh, because it was extremely dry. And so in this case with the infiltration on, uh, if your soil is extremely dry, you'll want to do it twice. And the second trial would be the more representative uh, data to include or to keep track of. So um, we can just note this and um, discuss management recommendations later on during the discussion. Okay, so next we will um, discuss the results from Ashleyman Farms and um, Lucas, if you will uh, just briefly discuss your management practices and your any soil health goals. Okay, uh, so yeah, again, we're, we're in Frankfurt, New York. So where we are, uh, Actually, this year we've had a, a decent amount of rain. We weren't too dry. We got a little bit dry towards the end of June, early July, but it seemed to kind of keep up with us this year. Um, so this field where we took a sample, this has been in grass for probably seven years. And before that, I think it was in small grains when we were uh, organic, but still grain fed organic. Uh, so yeah, everything at the moment for us is all grass. There's nothing really turned over. Uh, we do work with my oldest brother who has uh, some cash crop, organic cash crop, and uh, he's got chickens and, and laying hens. 
So we do rotate with him once, and you know, once we're kind of to the point where we see some of our fields starting to lose lose their uh, their power, I guess if you want to call it, and, and we'll we'll transition with him and, and just swap it over. Um, yeah, some of our goals, I don't know. I'll have to consult with my father. <laughs> if you I mean if you can hear him. The fields we did here, like the test, like the permanent grass fields, like we should actually uh, done a test with some of the land we switch over with my oldest son just to see a difference because I know like once you go in grass like this is the most forgiving thing for the soil so like these two these two type of fields we did the tests like the permanent grass and I, yeah I would say you know if we get three solid cuttings a year I think that's that's pretty good for us the way we can manage it with us just being two people so we work about we were just saying about 500 acres of land and uh, you know we milk about 100 120 cows so we're pretty busy but if we can get three solid cuttings a year get a good start at if uh, if willing at the end of may to get first cut that is key for us uh but you know i guess yeah it it it's basic that's why we kind of went grass fed it, it's kind of less is more kind of cut everything out and, and hopefully make good quality forage with the amount of time when you're mowing it. And hopefully at the end of the season, getting back in there with uh, compost and manure and, and feeding it again. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're gonna continue our journey into the hole that we've dug. <laughs> Um, so another assessment um, in this grouping of assessments um, is the texture by feel, which is based, based on uh, NRCS, um, uh, work done by NRCS. And so the purpose of this is to identify your soil texture and um, what you do is you take some soil and you wet it, you form a ribbon, and um, there is a guide within the data sheets and protocol guide, um, which I'm not going to share now. Um, it is available in that guide, and you just walk through the flow chart until you come to the point where you identify your soil type. Um, so that is all available in those protocols. Um, and the soil textures influence um, other components of soil health. So it's um, nice to know what you're working with there. And the soil texture may vary at, di at different depths. So um, we do uh, within the carbon proxy protocols work at different depths to, in to identify that <clears throat> at um, different sections of the soil. So here <clears throat> at this farm, the soil was identified as silt loam. Um, we also identified the topsoil depth to be four to five inches. Uh, so so topsoil depth is indicated by color changes um, and topsoil is usually darker. Uh, we also looked at aggregates at different depths in the hole. <clears throat> so soil aggregates are crumbly soil pieces or clumps that cling to plant roots, sometimes coating plant roots in a sheath of soil. In this assessment, um, we note the average size of these aggregates um, Aggregates are representative of active soil biology, giving soil, soil structure, increasing water and nutrient retention and resilience. So the results here, um, we, um, the aggregates at the top uh, were identified as granular, blocky, medium coarse, strong prevalence. Uh, the middle slice was blocky, medium coarse, strong and the lower slice was blocky, medium, and moderate. And those are all classifications that are all described in the manual as well. And so it's really just getting, getting in there and um, getting to know your soil. So 
So we also looked at root behavior at this farm. Uh, we identified the deepest root to be at eight to 10 inches and the majority terminated at six to seven inches. Um, and it was noted that there were uh, sideways root hairs on 60% of the roots. <clears throat> And I apologize, we did not get a, a good shot of inside the hole at this farm. Um, so the photo here is a slice of the soil that we took from, from the hole. And we also uh, performed the infiltration ass in assessment at this farm. Uh, the first trial was 28 seconds and the second trial was two minutes and 58 seconds. And um, that is all I have uh, to share from this farm. The next farm uh, that we're showcasing tonight is Hedgerow Hill Farm. And Adrian, would you like to share a little bit about your management practices and soil health goals? Oh, you are muted. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Let me try that again. Um, so the area that my farm is on is on top of a hill. So we have quite a bit of wind and uh, quite a bit of uh, rain and um, some con concerns about erosion. Um, the land that I'm on has been farmed uh, for the last 200 years and I've been farming here for the last five years. Um, so we are, the land that I'm doing um, my lambs and blueberries on is right now transitional organic. Um, it's in its second year. And the uh, land where the blueberries is on um, had quite a bit of um, prep before I was able to plant. Um, so it used to be a corn and soy field. Um, then I did a, I spread elemental sulfur um, to decrease the pH for the blueberries and planted buckwheat as a cover crop for um, well, multiple crops over the course of one year, uh, and then planted the blueberries earlier this year. And for my pasture where the lambs were, um, that's a hay field that um, has minimal management on it and little to no manure spread, at least for the last 10 years. Um, so we have um, somewhat low uh, soil fertility and organic matter in that area. Um, so in that space, I had, um, I did a rotational grazing uh, for this year and um, in the future, I'd like to see have uh, more organic matter um, and also different species of plant pasture plants. Um, one of my concerns is about erosion um, from the uh, rains that we have here on the hill. Um, so I'm really interested in my water filtration. Awesome, thank you. All right, so we haven't discussed this um, assessing the surface biology. Um, so for this assessment, um, we take a hula hoop or an equivalent size piece of string and place it over an area on the field that is representative of the growing space. Um, and then you'll count different types of grasses, broadleaf plants, insects, or other creatures uh, approximate what percentage is bare soil. The diversity of ecosystems is an indicator of resilience, landscape health, and may also give you clues to how your soil is changing over time. So this photo was taken um, from the field at Hedgerow Hill. Um, and so we noted that it was about 96% living cover, 4% bare soil, um, we identified that of that living co cover, 89% was orchard grass, 10% dandelion, and 1% vetch. And then other life that we noted that, were, that was present was one grasshopper, one beetle, and one fly. And um, we also dug a hole at Hedgerow Hill 
looked at roots. The deepest root there was at least 12 inches. The majority terminated at three and a half inches and about 5% were sideways or balled up. We also looked uh, at earthworms and um, counted earthworms. So this is another part of the digging a hole assessment that um, I haven't described yet. Earthworms are an excellent, are excellent soil health indicators. In this assessment, you take the soil that has been reserved from digging the hole, sift through it and count any earthworms. A biologically active thriving soil can have as many as 20 to 30 per shovel full. Spring is best for doing this test as worms love cool temperatures and soil moisture. So um, we did do this on a very warm, dry day, I believe. Um, and so we did count 12 worms and 44 of their burrows. Um, but I imagine if we had done it a different time a year, it definitely would have been higher. And we also did infiltration assessment at Hedgerow Hill. The first trial was 26 seconds and the second trial was one minute and 19 seconds. And that is my last slide. So that is what I have to share from our um, assessments at these three farms this summer. Um, does anyone have any questions at this point about the assessments? or any of the data results? Okay. So um, before we uh, jump into a discussion per period where we can sort of look at these results, discuss them and um, discuss any management recommendations, uh, Joseph Ansili is going to share some of his work, including a report that he um, worked on and was published recently. So I'll share some links to, there's a couple versions of the reports and he can uh, tell you more about it. Um, I will get your slide ready, Joseph. Awesome. Well, it's it's great to be here with everyone. Um, excited to share um, a new version or a new report that we just um, put together, characterizing um, about 1,500 soil health samples from across New York State. Um, and we've put together both a, a summary and a technical report. If you like a lot of data tables, that's also that's available. And the summary reports a shorter version. Um, but yeah, I have to acknowledge um, New York State Environmental Protection Fund for helping fund this work and this New York Soil Health Program um, based out of Cornell um, that, that works to collaborate um, with, with the really um, diverse network of, of people working on soil health, whether they're the NRCS, Soil Water Conservation District people, nonprofits like NOFA New York, American Farmland Trust, the Nature Conservancy, um, and all the incredible farmers we have across New York State. I guess next slide. So this is the the brunt of this report is um, basically characterizing. Um, <clears throat> different soil properties that were really important to soil health. Traditionally, we've, we've focused on, um, on soil chemical properties, phosphorus, potassium, pH. And while we measure organic matter a lot, we haven't, um, your routine soil test doesn't interpret these values. So what we did in this report is, is basically characterize um, these really important properties. Soil organic matter is probably the most important I guess keystone indicator you could think of for soil health um, across soil texture, which for me is um, as a soil scientist is, is really the most important soil property to understand how your soil functions. And it's really important for interpreting, um, interpreting how much organic matter your soil can have. 
Um, and then another thing that we looked at, which is unique and hasn't been done as much, is we looked at these indicators across different cropping systems. Um, annual grain, which is farms um, like Luke Gianforte who grow annual, um, annual corn cash crop, annual grain cash crops, corn, soybean, wheat. Um, the processing one is, is those big cabbage and, and snap bean farms that you see. And the mixed vegetable and the processed vegetable, that distinction was made to really hone in on, on small mixed vegetable farmers, a lot of them being organic in New York State. Um, and then we had a dairy, dairy crop, dairy category, a lot of dairy in New York State, and then a pasture and hay ground category. And as you can see, these results follow what, what, what makes sense. Um, and it's important here in the, in the top left corner, I have saying this is for loam textured soils. So we're comparing um, cropping systems within the same soil texture group. So we could see here that, for example, pastures and mixed vegetable farms were able to maintain the highest levels of soil organic matter followed by dairy cropping systems and annual grain and processed vegetable. And obviously there's, there's some farms that are very good at this and farms that are um, or soils that are higher and soils that are lower. And then next slide. And I just chose to focus on two indicators here for the sake of time, but similar to um, what the results for the, the infield slaking demonstration, this is basically the same thing, but you can also measure it in the lab and, and, get, a, and get a quantified number. But it, it really backs up that idea that, that undisturbed systems have, have the best aggregate stability. Living roots and their associated mycorrhizal fungi help build and stabilize these aggregates so that they're stable against rainfall events. So you could pretty reliably go out to a pasture field and maybe a field across the way that was conventionally tilled and take some crumbs from both those and see that difference there. This is, this is from a large uh, sample pool. And then basically systems that might have some tillage um, like mixed vegetable farms, dairy crop, but maintain higher amounts of organic matter, able to maintain a little bit better aggregate stability than some of the soils that are used more intensely. So next, next slide. And you can see one of the cool things about the report is just showing the very strong effect of, of cropping systems um, on soil health. So here's this for four biological indicators, soil organic matter, active carbon, which is this easily accessible food for life in the soil, soil protein, a lot of the organic matter is bound up in protein in the soil, respiration, an indicator of biological activity, available water capacity and aggregate stability, which we looked at. And um, when we look at all the samples, you can just see that if we don't, if the past, if the soils under pasture tends to have the highest soil health, um, followed by mixed veg and dairy crop, which are able to maintain intermediate, pretty good soil health. Um, so it's hard to com compare against that pasture undisturbed soil because we, we want to get something out of the soil. Um, and then the processing vegetables and grain crops, which maybe are using the ground the hardest, a lot of tillage, and maybe not harvesting a lot of the carbon and nutrients from the soil and not replacing those, um, that organic matter, which is a very fundamental um, value in organic, in organic systems. So last slide, I'll wrap up. Probably definitely took more than five minutes. Um, but basically what's useful about this report is it's, it's really key to understand how these things vary across texture because maybe a good soil organic matter or a, mean, a medium soil organic matter for a coarse textured soil is maybe 2.5, but for a silt loam, that's really low. So we got to make sure we're comparing apples to apples because these different um, soil types have different capacities to hold on to organic matter. And then also the cropping systems 
really affect the health of the soil. Um, and it might not be so fair to hold a small scale vegetable farm the same standards as a, as a cash grain operation. So maybe one of the big value things is um, having, improving our interpretation for New York State based on these two things um, and giving different types of farmers realistic goals to aspire to. So I'll leave it at that. And you can look at these reports. Um, and there's also a couple of videos online already with a more full presentation. And any questions, I would be happy to take any questions. Yeah, I was going to say we're, we're doing OK on time. We're a few minutes ahead. So if there are any questions or if there's anything else you want to add, um, I can also share in the links. Um, I think on your YouTube channel, you do have one of the a couple of videos uh, that go into more detail that we can share. Is that through the Cornell um, College of Agriculture, the videos? The, the videos are. Um... The videos are on, if you go to the New York Soil Health website or our YouTube page, they're on the New York Soil Health YouTube page. Okay, thank you. So I, I did add two links. There's the um, technical report and the summary um, in the chat and those will also be shared in the follow-up email tomorrow. Does anyone have any questions? All right, we will move on to the discussion portion. Um, and I realized <laughs> um, I never introduced myself and I neglected to introduce my colleagues who are also um, have been working on this project and also um, helping to facilitate this evening. So uh, Sarah Ficken will be uh, helping lead the discussion this evening. She is um, our dairy and livestock coordinator um, and I will let you take it away, Sarah. Hey, so um, yeah, I'm gonna be facilitating the discussion. I do have Sam with me. He is about two months old. Um, he's sleeping right now and hopefully you will stay that way. Um, so I've been looking in the chat and I don't see any questions, but I know I have a ton of questions. Um, in addition to being NOFA's dairy and livestock coordinator, I also have a dairy farm. Um, and we have a small diversified operation. So this has been really interesting to me. So for the farmers on the line, um, or I guess most of you are farmers, but for Luke and Lucas and Adrian, um, I would be really interested um, to hear from you what you feel are your most important soil health practices. Uh, well, yep, for... take it away. Yeah, I guess uh, for starters with our pastures, our biggest thing is, is rest in between grazings. Uh, that's huge for us. Um, you know, if, if everything works the way it should with the weather and, and we get rain and, and uh, usually we're on an average between 21 to, if we're doing really well, 30 day rest between pastures. And we're able to graze I don't know, 120 cows to 130 cows, probably about 80 acres from May until about mid July. Mm -hmm. And then from July till August, we'll have to stretch you, uh, probably give them an extra 20 acres on the farm. So yeah, or, I, or, 40. or 40 if need be. <laughs> well, if that starts anything, if that helps any. Yeah, so I guess what we've kind of found recently, um, we've kind of gotten away from, we used to traditionally always underseed all our small grains with red clover. Um, and for a number of uh, reasons, we've kind of gotten away from that, not necessarily just for soil health reasons, but for some of our markets. Um, so we've started putting a cover crop, uh, mixed cover crop in, after that um, small grain comes off, so late summer. And we've had seen pretty good results with that with some more grasses and some legumes and some brassicas all mixed in there. 
um, we get kind of a diverse mix going. And then we're able to apply some uh, chicken litter onto that and able to, you know, tie up some of those nutrients uh, for the following crop. So we've seen some pretty good results from that, um, but we still do use red clover in some places too. So that's kind of what we've been playing with the last couple of years. Um, for me, I'd, I'd say that one of the biggest ones is like a intensive rotational grazing. Um, so I have four acres uh, with sheep on them and I've moved them. I try and move them at least once a day and sometimes it gets to every other day. Um, and they're usually back on the same piece of uh, pasture um, within like about 40 days. Um, so trying to move them quick enough so that they're never gonna be re-eating or eating the new growth um, from plants that they just ate. Those are some really great answers. And I think, you know, as we take care of our animals and as we take care of our crops, um, you know, those practices really do drive how we build our soil health. Um, so all of you had tests done on your farms. Um, were there any results and I guess we can go in the same order, Lucas, Luke, and then Adrian, um, that you found um, surprising or interesting um, or any results that you, um, you know, or might be changing management or thinking about management um, because of. Yeah, well, good to see how deep the roots go. Yeah, oh yeah, it's always interesting to one. see how, how obviously uh, uh, deep our roots really do go. It is a, uh, Interesting. Uh, it was interesting to see that we couldn't find any worms, really, because it was so dry, I guess, for that stint. Uh, it was kind of disappointing. <laughs> but uh, And then the compaction. Yeah, and compaction on the soil, on the differences between even the pastures and what we crop. So we did stick the probe down, and it's it was insane. surprisingly, it went down smooth on both sides. So... You know, even though with the cows, when we intensively graze as well, you know, we kind of group them and, and for, for some reason, well, obviously for, for the way we manage it, the soil was still pretty, pretty loose and still, still working for the way we wanted it to. Yeah. And thanks to dry ears. Yeah. Um, yeah, one thing that we've been doing uh, more of lately um, and are looking to, to continue to do more of is we've been installing a lot of drainage tile. Um, and so that kind of helps, helps remove some of that water. We got a little more clay in our soil um, so we can be, be pretty wet a lot of the time. So putting drainage tile in, getting the wet spots drained and doing some pattern tiling in some other places has really kind of helped make it so that when we are out there doing tillage, the ground's drier. Um, so that's helped reduce some compaction. Um, and you can see like this summer, you could see where those tile lines were. Um, the roots were able to get, get down there deeper and the water was, um, even in a drought, you could still see the tile because we needed the drainage and where the wet spots were um, that aren't tiled, even though we were short of moisture, we still had a lower yield there. So um, that's something that we're kind of working on, keep working on, and um, it's a big investment, but well worth it. Uh, one of the things I was surprised about was how little plant diversity there was in my pasture. Uh, so that was really helpful for me to take a very close look and exactly what, um, what kind of plants are there um, and also how little animal diversity there was. So uh, although there's quite a few earthworms, uh, we didn't see that much else and it could have been because of the drought, um, but I would like to see that it has a good abundance and mix all the time. Um, one of the things that I think I would 
maybe start doing would be to like grass seed my pasture um, to try to add some more plant diversity into it. Um, so Adrian, you mentioned the drought this summer and Luke, you did as well. Um, and Lucas, you also talked about, you know, expanding your acres a little bit for um, grazing um, towards August when things start to dry up and burn up. Um, what methods are you using to sort of drought proof and also waterproof um, your farms, um, you know, in, in addition to tile and rotational grazing? Are you working on anything else? Uh, well, for us, again, we we have, i uh, say roughly 110 acres set on the home dairy. Uh, so early grazing season, we try to graze the back half first and keep everything that's, you know, close to the farm available for the months of uh, end of June, early July. And if it does work well, then we won't have to go down to the back 40, if you can call it. So it's about a mile walk actually with the herd to the furthest pasture. So uh, the way we try to, yeah, fight the, the drought is obviously let's try to graze the back half first when it's still kind of cool and the grass is still pretty powerful. We still do make good, uh, a good amount of milk on that, even though they have to walk that far. Uh, and then at the end of the season, if we're mowing and, and taking bales off of that during the season, we'll still have a chance to finish it off in, you know, end of September, early October. So we, ha we have the advantage of a good land base. You know, we're, we're really fortunate. We've got good land base around us. We're not fighting off too many other farms. So I think that's a fortunate thing we have. I think managing for drought and too wet is all comes back to soil health. Um, so we're constantly working on trying to bump our organic matter levels and constantly keeping something growing in the soil. And the healthier the soil is, the better it's going to perform. Um, you could see it this year. Uh, you know, these extreme years, either too wet or too dry, all show show where the healthy fields perform better and the less healthy fields perform not as well. Um, so trying to get everything up to par is, is a constant, a constant room for improvement. Um, and I think that's the, the biggest thing we can do for this continuing varying weather. Um. Um, to kind of think about both the the drought and the flood side, um, when we there's it was maybe like three years ago we had this huge um, like micro storm that hit the farm and there was a lot of water coming down, and I could I could see which of the fields were most damaged by it and there was um, you know you can like see the soil like washing off the fields and um, so. Since then, we've been really thinking about how we're managing steeper areas of the farm, um, making sure that there, there's crops planted there um, in the vegetable area, um, and then also thinking about which direction we're planting them so that they're running across the hill and not down the hill. Um, and that's been helpful. We're lucky that we own the land that or, or have a long-term lease on the land that's uphill from where the um, blueberries and the sheep are. Um, and then also for drought years, um, the lamb, I end up having to move them much more frequently because uh, there's just less nutrition. Um, and then I'm after this year, I'm really thinking about how I can scale up my water system so that they can have more water with them. And it means less moving water back and forth for me. Um, so I guess another question I have for you guys, and if anybody, um, in listening in has questions, I'd love to either see them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and throw them out there to our speakers. Um, but another question I have is, do you guys routinely soil test like prior to us coming out? And if you do both, what time of year do you find useful for soil testing? And, um, 
with what frequency will you retest a field? Uh, so this was actually in my uh, stint on the farm the second time we've done soil sampling and I actually did one last year with the pastures that I thought were kind of on the lower end. Um, I don't know, did you, how many times have you soil sampled or? We used to soil sample before we were grass fed. And when we went to grass fed, like we never soil sampled, except when the Maple Hill Co-op did grass, uh, soil sample all the grass farms. That's mm -hmm. when we started again. Mm -hmm. And of course, this time. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's when it's available and when we have time, we'll, we'll definitely do it. Uh, but I, I think it's a good practice for sure. And uh, I think, yeah, doing it at the, the fall season is probably the best. Let's see what we've done and what we can improve on. And, uh, and yeah, organic matter again for us was something that we like to see. And even with the poor pastures, I, I saw some good results, anything that ranged from five to 7%. So I was pretty happy with that. We've always soil tested. Um, usually we'll test something once a year. Um, not all the fields uh, necessarily, but uh, the past few years we've been part of a NRCS program with some cost sharing, doing some soil health tests. Um, so that's been interesting to see because we've been in it for four or five years now. And so we're kind of circling back to, we'd always sample in the same place in a rotation after it was coming out of small grains. So now we're circling back to some of those same fields again and being able to compare them and see how, how things have changed in the past few years. Um, and then we'll also, if we have two fields that are kind of acting differently or we can't explain what's, what's going on, We'll sometimes soil test those more often or pull tests every year on them just to see where where we're at. So we're usually soil sampling something at least at least once a year. Um, and we traditionally do it in the fall, that early September time frame um, when the soil's cooled down a little bit, but not not before everything stopped growing. So what kind of changes have you seen over time um, as you've resampled some of the same fields through your NRCS program? So we've seen organic matter go up in some places um, and we use the uh, woods end soil health tests and so they're showing some biological activity as well. Um, so I don't know there's a lot of there's a lot of data in those tests and trying to decipher it all and figure out exactly what what the answer is or what you're seeing and how what management decisions have changed those results um, in that time frame is definitely uh, more of an art than a science. Um, so I guess seeing organic matter matter levels climb um, has been kind of the easiest thing to see, um, so yeah. Uh, we do soil testing just about every year in the spring. Um, up until uh, five years ago, um, we were kind of moving around on different to different pieces of land that we're leasing for short periods. So this has been the longest time we've been on just one piece of land. Um, usually we send our test to Dairy One in Cornell and to, or in Ithaca um, and do lab testing. And this was the first year that I've done kind of more of this like qualitative um, soil properties test. And I found that really beneficial. I felt like it was telling me more about, uh, or I guess just different information um, that was helpful to be, to have in collaboration with the soil tests. 
That, these have all been really amazing questions. And I feel like as a farmer, I've learned so much from each of you. So I really, I really appreciate that. Um, does anybody else listening in have any questions either for um, our three farmers or for our other speakers? I just wanted to make a quick quick comment that um, about the earthworms. You know, um, we we do testing on many farms annually, um, and we just test around the same time of year each each year. And I have seen across the board this year earthworm counts go down um, no matter what time of year we uh, did the count, <clears throat> and across all of the farms basically. So I think um, you know, so I think it was uh, Luke or Lucas who mentioned just uh, being surprised by. I think it was you, Lucas, being surprised by not being able to find earthworms in that test spot. And you know, that's just uh, it's been a common experience for me for all the different farms I've gone out to. That farms that usually have a higher earthworm count have um, very few or or none. So I think that's a, a drought condition. I don't know if uh, Joseph has any um research or data uh that he can share with us about kind of how earthworm populations tend to fluctuate with um drought conditions um but i'd be interested to hear what you have to say as a scientist about that i mean i think yeah earthworms need need moisture and they're either deeper in the soil or um yeah waiting to waiting to come up again um if you if you guys are interested i'm sure i could dig something up but definitely soil soil moisture is critical for them to live you, and you see that when or i guess that's a, another reason but yeah you guys got it so just don't be discouraged by that not this year <laughs> so one question um i just got in the chat um from adrian was could we discuss more about how farmers can decide which of these tests to do for a general soil health overview? Um, Adrian, I'm guessing that's aimed more towards Caro and Joseph than to the other panelists. Is that accurate? Yeah, or I mean, whoever would want to talk about that. I'm just thinking if you don't have time to do all of the tests that are in the book, like how do you prioritize and look at them? Um, I can weigh in on what what I think is particularly generally interesting and how I might decide um, that question. But um, Joseph and Brianna, if either of you want to weigh in on that as well. Um, I guess, you know, for me, a lot of it would be the first question I'd look at is what equipment do I have easily on hand? Not every farmer is going to have a penetrometer. I think it's awesome if you are enough of a soil nerd to want to have a penetrometer. Um, the penetrometer is one of those tools, though, that's really uh, influenced by um, moisture. So um, it's the kind of thing that if it's been really wet or really dry, you know, you might want to um, take the results with a grain of salt. Um, if you have access, I mean, every farmer has access to a shovel, right? So digging a hole is really the place to start, although the texture aspect of it um, takes a while to learn. Um, we try to give you as simple instructions as we can in the manual for how to do that, but it's the kind of thing where you really, you do need to kind of get some practice to kind of learn how to classify your aggregates. But looking at biopores, looking at root behavior, um, looking at where, how deep your topsoil is, that's really easy to do um, with very little, little training. Um, and then finding YouTube videos that explain how to evaluate rhizosheathing and soil texture are a great next step. So that's all you need for that is a shovel. Um, in terms of the other tests, if you can um, if you can get access to a uh, piece of sewer pipe, just that blue plastic stuff, and just cut it into a four inch cylinder and sharpen one end the way that I made my infiltration rings is just uh, again that six inch sewer pipe that you can get. It's like forty bucks for an eight foot length. Um, we uh, marked it off and chopped it with a chop saw and then sharpened one end with a diamond blade on an angle grinder. It's really quick. Um, and that test with uh, 444 milliliters of water, like we say in the instructions, um, just do that a few, you know, throughout the year, it's an easy thing to just go out with a jug of water and just do that under different um, rainfall conditions. If it's really dry, if it's really wet, just kind of, it's a way to get a sense of your soil a little bit better. Um, drought conditions are going to make that water slow down. If you feel saturated, it's going to make it slow down. But the perfect conditions are a few days after a rainfall with field, field moist conditions, where if you squeeze the soil, you don't get it coming out like a sponge, but it still holds together in a ball. That's the perfect conditions to do an infiltration test. 
Um, and that will tell you a lot. Joseph, I don't know if you have any thoughts about any of those things I just brought up or Brianna. But... No, I think the I think the best best visual tool is or my favorite thing is just digging around with a spade and and breaking open clods and seeing seeing what's inside. Um, yeah, seeing definitely looking for the major some of the major physical constraints, noticing noticing the the surface structure from the one extreme, if there's crusting to, to what the aggregates look like, if they look like uh, cookie crumbs and have a more rounded, beautiful structure, earthworm middens at the surface. And then just, and even taking a six inch or a six inch slice with a spade and just taking it out of the hole and, and looking at, looking at uh, on the ground is, is really useful to maybe you see a disc pan five inches below the ground or or you see a lot of those earthworm holes. And so, yeah, those those signs are really important. And Thanks for that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the only thing that I would just add to that is just sort of looking at what sort of goals you have um, as far as like, what is it that you're trying to understand? Because I think as um, Carol laid out in the beginning, um, doing a comparison can be really valuable. Um, and But then also um, sort of looking at one spot um, with one test over time to, to see progress um, and whether your progress is, you know, that you're really, um, aiming to sequester carbon or whether um, you're looking at production goals. I think, you know, it can be like a little bit of both, um, but just sort of honing in on um, what is accessible and, and what aligns with your goals. And I and one more thought also is like, um, I think one of the most important things is just like when you're out there, use your knowledge of, of your farm to ask the best possible questions and, and having a contrast will always help you get more information than than just one spot or if there's one spot you're wor you think is is the worst that are close by and another spot that you think is the best digging a hole in those two places can give you a lot of insights and that and that comparison rather than just looking at at one spot can be can be really useful I completely agree um I think what you just said, Brianna, about the goals is a really, really helpful um, thing to bring up too. So if I think if you, if you, you know your land, you know, so looking at the tests and kind of thinking about the way you've, what you've observed on your own farm and thinking where you might think you might have constraints. Like if you think you might have a plow pan, if you think that you are um, having some uh, root constraints with your crops or, um, if you're looking at, um, you know, a lot of farmers that I work with are uh, diversified vegetable growers. And so they're, in, um, they're really interested in their infiltration rate on some of the higher organic matter farms because they're seeing um, a certain amount of hydrophobia on their, with their mulching and their high organic matter soils at the surface. So one way we're starting to use infiltration rate is actually identifying when a farm is having difficulties with their water infiltration because their surface is so high in organic matter because of no-till and compost mulching. So there's just a lot of different ways to use these tools um, based on your own knowledge and your own goals. So I think that's a really great point. Thank you guys, that was really interesting. Um, does anybody else on the call have any questions for our panelists? Um, you can either put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself if you would like. I'm always interested in cover crop, cover crop selection choices and maybe this is mostly for Luke so far, but what, what kind of cover crops and mixes are you planting and how, how does that, how are those helping you achieve your goals? So we're kind of planting whatever whatever we got. Um, this year it ended up being a mix of oats and rye, uh, some peas, some forage brassicas, and then some different types of clover. Um, last year we did a similar mix with some turnips in it. Um, we were a little heavier on the rye 
um, and not so heavy on the oats. I kind of swapped them this year um, because the other trick to it is, is, um, is the mechanical practices of it in terms of termination in the following year and how to work it in. Um, the red clover were traditionally moldboard plowing in. So trying to get away, reduce some tillage with some, and you while still using cover crops. Um, so trying to get something that's gonna live through the winter, but some of it's gonna die out so that we don't have quite as much um, to terminate in the spring. Um, so it's, a, it's constantly evolving and we're trying different ratios and different mixes, so. So I don't know if you guys just saw what Caro put in the chat, um, but if you have a couple minutes, um, she's looking for some feedback. Um, and if you could fill out her um, her form, that would be fantastic. It's just a, a survey that various uh, NUFA chapters have put together to um, get a sense of what uh, farmers in the Northeast need in terms of technical support, education, incentives, policy, um, uh, to, to guide our policy and education work. So thanks in advance. Yeah, I think if, um, if nobody else has any questions, I am just going to pop in our evaluation link. Um, we did receive a lot of feedback from our summer webinars and uh, we're able to incorporate some changes. So we do appreciate the feedback. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, just another thing that will be coming up, I think, um, Brianna, what I'll be doing um, on my end, sort of as our soil health uh, coordinator within the Interstate Council is pulling together, um, <clears throat> we've, we've done a lot of actually remote of course, soil health uh, field days this year um, across all of the NOFA chapters. So one of my goals for this fall as we're um, wrapping up a lot of this education this year is to put together um, a resource of all of the videos from all of these webinars that all of us NOFA chapters have done into one place. Um, so I'm not sure if that's gonna be like a shared YouTube channel or a um, file on the Interstate Council, we're still figuring that out, but um, that's also something to look for from um, your NOFA chapter is a, a link to this entire season's worth of soil, soil health field days uh, that are remote. So just a little note about that upcoming resource as well. Yes, and Kara will be um, presenting at our winter conference uh, a little bit more, providing some more um, of her experience and data from doing the ca carbon proxy protocols in the region. Um, so more to come. <laughs> But um, does anyone else have any last thoughts or, or anything they want to add that um, they didn't get to include earlier? I just wanted to say thanks to all the NOFA folks for putting this on. And I learned a lot through the process. Awesome. Yeah, thanks to everyone who helped with this. I felt like it was a, a big um, a big project that we took many months doing and I uh, really appreciate all the farmer participants, Luke, Lucas, Adrian, uh, Joseph and Caro, you, you all were a huge help. And then um, also Emma and um, Robert and Sarah uh, on the NOFA New York team. So thanks everyone. And um, you'll receive our follow-up email tomorrow. Thanks so much to the farmers. I uh, I was supposed to be able to come out and meet some of you this year, but maybe maybe next year it'll be more possible. So I hope hope that we get to see each other in person someday. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much. Have a good evening. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks for Thanks. Have a great night.